And let's get ready to chase rabbits! Hey, hey, hey. Oh, hey everybody, this is the Rabbit Trail Podcast. I just thought I would start it differently since I wasn't here last week, but hey, we're uh-huh. glad you're joining with us. And this is the Rabbit Trail Podcast number episode 131. 131. <laughs> it's 131. And views who are <laughs> echoing behind me are the, my fellow rabbit chasers. And uh, we are out to chase the truth wherever it runs. This is the podcast where we pick up things that are dropped on the floor and kind of just chase after a your ideas, your thoughts out there on the interwebs and um, are and picking up things that we, you know, laid down and set off running from the sermons. But interweb. Yeah. The I, interwebs. The interwebs. Interweb. Interweb. The internets. Yeah. The systematic web of webinators. That, anyway. That almost sounded like my dad where it's just mm-hmm. like, you know, that inter uh, interwebby thing that you guys deal with. So, well, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. You're old. Anyway, so we're <laughs> glad that you're with us. And why don't you guys say hi, my co, uh, my co, co, co team here. Hello, my name is Stephen Oldham, the local outreach pastor here at All Branch. And yeah, let us know if you're watching this podcast, where you're watching it on. If you're listening, make sure that you like and uh, subscribe the episodes and the actual podcasts. And if you're watching online, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell. And more than importantly, no matter how you listen, it'd be great if you could share it with somebody if you like what you hear. Yes, and my name is Brent Branch, and I'm the Connections Pastor here at All Branch Church, and we would love to discuss your questions. We have three of them this week, so we're excited about that, but if you have a question, it doesn't have to pertain to the sermon topic or anything else. If you have any life situation questions or if you have any theological questions you would like us to discuss or answer for you, uh, let us know at rabbittrail at obcc.church, rabbittrail at obcc.church. Church. Hey, I just want to say thanks for putting up with me on my little you know, opening there because you guys did a double opening last week. It was pretty fascinating. Like I turned it on. It's like, wait, this is a rabbit trail podcast. You guys went through your thing and then suddenly you went, oh, hey, this is a rabbit trail podcast. And it just picked right back up again. So I was like, oh, oh did they just wow. leave it on there? Yeah, it's just it's not trimmed. Just so you know, well, it's kind of fun. So, we did mess up, though, didn't we? Didn't yeah, we, we mess up over. and start it over again? Yeah, and it's all on there. It's beautiful. Oh. This there you go. This, the is, this is the kind of quality deterioration that happens when you miss a week, Greg. That's, that's we okay. either we don't rather, have the little buffer song, or we, did this we, time. Or we yeah, have four did. intros. I, I just was happy that your theology didn't stink. Yeah, at least I think. <laughs> Me too, because I haven't, I haven't. You haven't watched haven't it. Actually, watched it. So <laughs> your theology that can't be wrong if I didn't listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's right. There you go. So what, um, you know, but, uh, but again, you had that family emergency last week. I'm glad everything worked out. And, uh, yeah, it's one of those like, oh my gosh, something might be wrong. Just kidding. Yeah. Well, at least it's a, it's not bad. So that's good. Yeah. But it's sort of like I was expensive, but not bad. (laughs) Right. It was sort of like I was explaining, like we had a, we had a, you know, Gina who has been on our podcast and has been part of our church for years. You know, she and her husband were in Hawaii when that guy accidentally bumped the wrong button about the incoming missile yeah. that they couldn't retract so that they were everybody's like we're all gonna die goodbye goodbye you know it's like so you're all saying your goodbyes you know you're transferring your money to your children all that kind of stuff and then suddenly it's like oh just kidding at least everything turned out okay it's like Are and you mom me? i'm not giving that money back <laughs> but when i mean like you think about that what happens everybody gets mad you put me through that and it didn't happen but you know when it comes to like your children and medical stuff nobody gets to get mad because yeah. it's like oh at least they're okay they were okay to begin with. You just made me think they weren't, and then I had to go run around and do a whole bunch of stuff. So, yeah. but I, is, I'm not bitter. I'm just saying it is a relief, even though you know you were in the ER till till morning time and exhausted. But yeah. but it is a they relief did a great that job. everything. Oh, the Corona is, Corona ER. I'm just we have a awesome awesome lady in our church who who works there, and she just she did a bang up job, just amazing. Right. So is the ER Corona ER pretty darn yeah, impressive. Good things about the Norco uh, was it urgent care as well. For mm-hmm. some reason. Ooh, I need to go to that mm-hmm. Norco Urgent Care then. Yeah. So anything anything beats uh, the, the veterans hospital. Uh, honestly, anything, yeah. yeah. I feel like we're getting like to become old people. We're sitting around talking about Get our off families. my lawn. <laughs> we're talking about our ambulance, like uh, gather together and just like, oh I heard, what what did you find out last week about your kneecap? So oh I, I consider know, it we, we are getting old because yesterday I spent a significant part of the day telling Stephen about this new thing that helps relieve pain. So I was like, <laughs> Hey, buddy. So there's like one elderly. moaner to another. Try this. So 
elderly, elderly community center. Oh, no, yeah. yeah like, it was funny. I mean, They're I would go to our elders' people. retreats, and I would have to spend, like, the first, like, like why does this four like hours ben Gay? listening to them all talk <laughs> about their ailments and what they had recently just been to the doctors for. And it's yeah. like, I'm like, I was like 30. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going yeah. like, I have no context for this right now. And this uh, wasn't even the prayer request time. This was just normal no, everyday just conversation. Normal, for like, hey, we all just got together. All. What's been going yeah. on in your life? Well, let me tell you about my doctor. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's pretty awesome. You prefer Tiger Bomb or Ben Gay? Which yeah. one do you prefer? Tiger, Tiger Bomb. <laughs> I like the Tiger word better. So one of the things I, um, you know, I got this thing because I'm, I'm an unorganized person in general, and so I got me this tablet thing that is hopefully going to help me not throw be, away your your notes yes, when you you're know, ready to go at the end. Oh, yeah, yes, that's something really you, important next yeah. week. You Did write, you ever bring it up? You write stuff down. I don't and know. If, yes, no, I never found it, but you know, you write stuff down. Did anybody else figure it out for us? No, 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 no. Okay, no, nothing. Nothing was next week. You have a tablet, so yeah so so you know it's just like i got this thing where i can keep everything in one place so i was just kind of looking through some of my yearly goals over the last few years you know and i I'd, I'd put on there like you know every year for a yearly goal was to jog a mile a day and so i was just looking at my log and it was like you know 2021 didn't jog 2022 didn't jog 23 didn't jog 24 still haven't jogged and i mean as you can tell it's a running joke right Oh, but I, oh. but I did, I did, I did realize this that that if you eat cake and ice cream fast enough, your Fitbit thinks you're jogging. So <laughs> you can jog and eat. Oh, I think that just jogged our memory that this was Brent and his terrible jokes. There you hey. go. Hey, I just added to your terrible joke. That's Thank fun. you. I like it. All right. Well, thanks, Brent, for that. Uh, Stephen, you got I mean, you jump out there in the dark side of the interweb. Yeah. Like, there's uh, one particular comment. The was, interweb. Is that really a word? No. I, it's okay. something from my PN90X guy. Okay. Okay. Like, Tony they say, well, like, they I'm like, I don't know that I've heard like that. Funny. Am I missing some new, new uh, I'm making vernacular? It new. So. Well, it's not new vernacular. Some people use it as a joke. Yeah, interwebs okay. or internet. I'm trying to do. Okay. Like, it's yes. trying to be funny. It's not working. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Greg and his terrible jokes. <laughs> <Ding>. <laughs> I will say this, though. You you do have a history of and a reputation for terrible jokes. making up words. No, what? Making up words. Making up words. Yes. Can you name a word I made up? I don't. I can't offhand. But then why, remember, how is this a reputation? I, uh, you know, I don't know. But you know that we used to make fun of you for always making up words. You all I thought just, I made up words, and you looked them up in the dictionary and went, dang. When was this? Just because they're in the dictionary doesn't mean it's a real word. If you can use it, in this a goes back before I met you guys, so <laughs> I have no idea. It goes this almost sounds like a youth yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> I use the word eschatology, and he's like, "What? That's not a real word." Yeah. Now he uses it all the time when he goes to the restroom. Ex- he uses the eschatology. Yes. <laughs> Exoskeleton. Oh, okay. Theology goes not together. Eschatology. Oh. Oh, wait. That's still that's not. Yep. Not scatological. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> that's scatology. Brent yeah. is horrible grammar. That. Biblical scatology. That's not something I want I to I do talk have about. that book. There is a book that I talks about it. all kinds by, of weird it's things. It's funny because it's by Joseph Smith the third. The third. It's a book all about the scatological things within the he Bible. He converted to real Christianity, mm-hmm. I just yeah. want to say. Just, just interesting. Go ahead, Stephen. What's we, out we, there? We do say this every week now. It's just like, wow, we really started... Getting off the rails. <laughs> On a rabbit trail? It's, it's really not getting off the rails anymore when you do it every single week. Yeah, or it's or the name of your <laughs> just us. Well, the name of your podcast is The Rabbit yes, Trail. Exactly. <laughs> what you do go. you expect when you turn this thing on? There you go. If you expect a linear program, you're in trouble. I want focused. <laughs> I want you guys to focus. Everybody out there without ADD is freaking out. <laughs> Why don't these people focus? <laughs> All right. So All right. Back, back to, to the dark see. side of the interwebs. Uh, there's only really one. There's a good comment there about the truth about Jesus' popularity, which is from the sermon clip. And this is Jesus is Lord, King, uh, Jesus, and then lots of hearts. So that person liked it. So that's All good. Right. Mm-hmm. The other one is just the comment from Alan Paredes, 2427, who just simply states, Jesus is a fictional character. No punctuation. <laughs> Whoa. From what TV show? I don't, I don't know. I'm just like... Socrates and Plato and everyone else from You're history. You're saying Socrates is a fictional character? Yeah, sure. If Jesus is. 
Mm. I mean, there's more potential Socrates actually was a fictional. Yeah, I know. Because he's just referenced in Plato's works. So right. We don't actually have anything written by Socrates. A lot of Julius Caesar stuff comes m- later, too. And so. I always think it's interesting. People are like, oh, the Socratic method. I'm like, why don't we call it the Platonic method since Plato's the one writing everybody about Socrates? Because doesn't Platonic mean you're just friends? <laughs> it does yeah. now. Yeah. So people would get confused. But just, just for Alan How about Bar- Plutonic? Mm-hmm. Paredes, the idea, I will say very few, even devout atheist scholars, I believe that Jesus was a fictional character. So you're kind of going against conventional thought about Jesus not being a, a, a real person, if that's what you think. You have, may not think he's God, but that isn't necessarily something that you can just claim is fictional. So that he wasn't, he didn't exist. Yeah, you would have to make the claim that like Abraham Lincoln, that Julius Caesar, that There's a lot Charlemagne. More, well, Shakespeare being one, right? There's a right. lot less evidence of Shakespeare being a real person. In fact, it's highly debated in some people's lives just because we don't have a lot of records of him actually. And yet, you know, most people think Shakespeare was a real person, so... Yeah, he you was have just, he way just more stole, evidence. Yeah. He just stole from yeah, them. Yeah, well, they, well, there's way more evidence for Jesus than there is for Shakespeare. Well, especially circumstantially cur- surrounding him, they named Judas, you know, you named like somebody like uh, Pontius Pilate. Who yeah. is, we've got a stone with Pontius Pilate's name on it. We've got Caiaphas. We've found James, who is declared the brother of Jesus. You know, like it probably w- is his actual ossuary box. I mean, we've got a lot of... A lot of evidence archaeologically of the locations and the different things that go on. And it's really interesting because where I think our culture like goes, <laughs> oh, you have oh, it's some history, tradition. It's like, no, actually, tradition is one of those cases that's really hard to break. When, when human beings traditionally believe something, you revisit that site every single year. They, you would do pilgrimages. And Pretty pilgrimages good, yeah. to Jerusalem and to the sites of Jesus date back far into the second first centuries whether you call it bce or ce the way that we even measure time is based on the event of christ's birth relatively speaking now granted that was done later in history that they yeah but i mean they they thought of it as a pivotal human event that even other cultures adopted it yeah so it's really bizarre that you know people use that as a marker of history it, even really even in other cultures for, for them i would suggest like take up and go go watch or go read uh j warner wallace's book called um person of interest yeah and he's it's, a detective he, it's a really good book laying out the evidences that line right up to jesus and all of the fallout that happens after him. he does it's a really cool video series if you can get a hold of that but it's also excellent material just as a book and, and I think that takes away this myth of Jesus concept like oh he's a fictional character fictional characters don't have this kind of impact on history now to steel man your argument it would have been better to say that Jesus is the way you interpret him I don't believe is real in the sense of who he was as a person that's a different question but the question that he didn't exist is not one that most people think it's not the common knowledge whether you're religious or not so yeah. All right. So, um, so this sermon series that we're going to be, dis- well, it's not a series. It's a one-off. And for Ooh. all of you that don't know what that is, it is just a sermon in between two series that was kind of a standalone message. <laughs> it's the so, meat in between just, two buns. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the stuffing and the Oreo cookie. <laughs> yes. The, um, the, the message was titled <laughs> Serve and He Will Show Up. So it was about serving and using your giftedness. So first off, just, you know, to get inside your head, um, That's scary. why did you pick that as a standalone message? Is it just because we have serve week coming up and all that stuff or was this planned? It was, I mean, it was planned to help people understand the need to allow Jesus to work through them in the congregation. Like we were doing, Hey, sign up for the various ministries that we need to kind of work out and fulfill. And when you have a congregation as Christians, obviously we believe that we are to work together to do the work of Christ. And so this all comes from first Corinthians chapter 12, which is this idea that God has gifted the church, the people of the church, to live out the life and the body of Christ. That word body comes from that section. To live out Christ's works on earth. Like our bodies work out our spirits, our desires, and will. And so he that idea of he manifests was this idea he shows up. And that was a big deal for me to say that I think a lot of people can wonder whether they're saved or not. And some of one of the evidences that you are actually saved is that the spirit manifests, he shows up in your life when you're serving in these gifts, when you're doing the works of Jesus in a community 
of Christians. I mean, Stephen, you'll you'll even say like some of your natural gifts, gifting that you may have. You, you've talked about this a lot. Is like you've seen in your natural gifts kind of suddenly amplify when you're in the presence of the of Christian in the church. Yeah, you can amplify or it cannot actually be. You might discover you have a totally different gift as well. But also, yeah, the idea that you're using it for the Lord in service gives it a more of a spiritual connotation because it used to be something you used in your everyday life which i guess the old testament would call profane which doesn't mean bad it just means used for common knowledge and then when you use it for the lord it becomes a holy object and this and it's the same with your gifts when you use them for the lord they reflect something of heaven in the way that you're using them so odd things can happen that are not normal that even though you're using the same gifts or, or talents or abilities so so let me ask you this and i mean this wasn't on topic this one in my notes that i wrote down from the sermon and you didn't talk about it in the sermon but um the idea that you know some i mean obviously we're all we all serve and you know we talk about serving in our giftedness we ser- we talk about serving in our talents um as well um and so what do you what do you think about the idea and again i'm not this isn't like to tell people what they need to do obviously that's between them and the lord but you know people who like i'm a school teacher i'm gifted with kids i have a talent for kids and training in that but i don't want to do that in ministry because that's my vocation you know and i'm just using children's ministry as an easy reference but you know um because that is kind of where you're probably gifted that's probably where your talents lie you have training in that area but I do understand I do this 50 hours a week. You know, I would rather do something that I deem more fun on Sundays in serving the body. What, what do you think about using, you know, vocational and ministerial? And I mean, it doesn't totally have to be separated. I, 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 you can yeah, do I, ministry in I your vocation. I struggle because you're using the term vocational. And classically speaking, we wouldn't use that term apart from your calling. So what your calling is is the same in the church and out of the church. You don't get to divide like, I do this every day of the week, so I don't want to do it for the Lord. No, you're doing every what you do every day of the week for the Lord. Mm-hmm. And that would obviously imply that why wouldn't you do that for the people that you consider your family? I mean, if I'm a dishwasher every day of the week and I go home, it's like the weekend, I'm like, I'm not washing the dishes for my family. You guys wash the dishes. Like, it would be like, that's kind of weird. You know, it's like. Why, why wouldn't we, that's, it's sort of like you meet people who are like the electrician or whatever, who's like, I do this every, and my house is the worst electrically wired place in the world, right? And you're like, that's weird. Like, mm. why wouldn't you care for, care about your family more than you care about whether or not you got somebody paying you money for it kind of stuff. It, and it, it is a reality that we get tired and things like that. But I do struggle with that. I mean, personally, I struggle with that. It'd be like me going like, Oh, well, you know, I, I've cared for my kids all week long. I'm not going to care for you people because it's, it's Sunday. Like, why would I want to care for you people? I have to pastor my family all day long. Like, I don't get that excuse. Nobody. Why would we give anybody else that excuse in that kind of a sense? But that don't, doesn't mean your job will necessarily line up also with your, your giftedness in the church setting. Steven's thinking something. I just want to throw it away. Yeah, my bad. Look at it differently because I don't like washing dishes and I wouldn't want to do that for the church or for my job. <laughs> I think of that as a skill and sometimes those skills don't translate, but I don't think it gets you out of service. So if the act of serving in the community could look different in the church, you could sweep, you could clean, you could do uh, you know, shaking hands or just the idea that you serve your family and don't serve the church, that would be odd. But the idea that you might have to do the same thing as your what you do as a profession, as a skill, I don't know if that's always required. I think it's I think it's nice when people get to explore areas of their life that they're not locked into because of life circumstances. Like when I got in the Air Force, I did contract law and contract stuff. I don't ever want to do that again. Not for the church, not for the military. It's not, I discovered that what I spent time learning and doing well, I did not want to do. Unless God had asked me to do that for the church, then I would I would offer it, but it wouldn't be something I would look to do as a, a as a routine thing to offer as a service. Yeah, so I would distinguish that as a job versus yeah, a vocation. A skill or, Again, a vocation's calling. That we have yeah, to we have to callings are different. Yeah, calling is something that shouldn't be ignored in or out of the church. Now, obviously, vocation came out of like the Lutheran concept and the Catholic concept where you have a, you know, pastors and priests who are the laic, you know, the, they're the, they're the, the called into that. And then everybody else is their calling in the general life. 
And so I understand there's a difference in the in our Baptist tradition or in the Protestant tradition away from like Lutherans and, you know, pres- more in the Presbyterian side where the congregation is a part of life. Um, yeah, it's just it, a lot of people would just say, why would you why would you take what God has made holy and go make it profane? You know, mm. God gave you this gifts. So why would you use it for the common vocation of your life, common work of your life, if you're working in your giftedness and then not want to use your giftedness there? I, I really would think that that would be something you're going to have to answer to the Lord over. Um, like, hey, I use this. You gave me this gift and I, I multiplied it everywhere out there, but not in your kingdom. Um, that, that seems weird to me. Like, no, I'm not saying this is a difficult conversation because we do men, we do church quote unquote, like church services. That's very different than, you know, we're talking like the fourth, fifth, sixth, even 13th century, which is very church. The way you did church is very different. It was a very social reality where you didn't drive, you know, 20 minutes to get to your, your church, you know? So it's, 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 it's a little bit of an arbit, an unfortunate cultural difference that we're working through. It's like whatever you've been gifted in, in life, you should be willing to offer it to your church family. That's the way I would look at it. I mean, if you're really good in business, you enjoy it. it it's a passion of yours. I think it's would be weird that if you didn't help use that passion for the church, but that is often a bigger thing than just a particular skill is all I'm saying. Mm. So like a, like skills are different. Like if you like to serve and it might look different in the church than outside the church, but you would still be serving. I know people like to build stuff in the community, like to build stuff in the church. So, hmm. yeah, it, it, again, skills, jobs, when we're talking about giftings, we're talking about well, it's usually like God yeah. wants to bring about as you coordinate in service to the church. Yeah, like a vocation but, is like a li- to me, I think of it as a, a more of a lifelong or long term calling that you have the ability to do you usually refine it through skill and other things. But you, you have a passion for it typically, or if you're trying to reject it, you're kind of rejecting a portion of something that is pretty crucial to you. Um, Cause I know you can reject a calling <laughs> and usually though you're empowered to do that calling and you're just pushing that away in some way, either in your life or in the church. So that's a, that's a thing people can do as but well. But I get what you're saying too, Steven. It's like, like if I had to, do I have to do church ministry because yeah. I'm a good teacher? Uh, it's, no. No, you have to serve, but I, you know, but again, I, I, th- I just, I'm like, oh, that as somebody who cares about the quality that student, that children would get or students would get, like, you know, some, my, some of my best youth leaders were teachers, you know, they, they cared about the kids. I mean, your wife was one of them. She cared about the kids be- because she had a passion for them in her normal life and was like, well, I want to continue to care about them as well. And, um, and I know like for her too, it was like doing it in ministry was, it's like the best part of, of her job, you know? Right. It's like, I can get away from the stuff I hate about, you know, about what my is, job was, and just focus on the stuff that I love about it. And that's the kids and working with the kids. And it, it, like for some people, I found that church is a greater passion in the sense that they got into a situation where they like what they're doing, but they don't really like where they're working or they feel like the company's values are slightly different than their own or something like that. And so coming into the church provided them an opportunity to kind of feel like they're sig- spiritually significantly offering something that they couldn't offer in, the, in their profession. And so I find the church, I know that's why people, why do so many people volunteer? I'm like, because they see the value of it, they offer their time. And it's like people volunteer for baseball. They volunteer to usher. Mm-hmm. They do all this stuff because they have a passion for this being a cultural a moment of community sharing. I feel the same way about church. I, I found people who couldn't do what they wanted to do in life. Like my friend, he really wanted to serve people. He liked to make coffees and things, but he couldn't do it because he was in the Air Force and he's kind of stuck doing a job he just had to do. But he looked forward to like, how do I serve people coffee while people are in Bible study? And he had a whole thing. And I was like, man, this is like a passion of yours. But it led to like, I really like hospitality. I really like making people feel welcome. And he couldn't, he wasn't provided that opportunity in his daily life. So, but you could see that his gift was opened up because the church yeah, offered the gift it. of hospitality. Yeah. It was just flowing out of him. Yeah. And, and he liked to host people at his house, but no one really paid attention. So you have this whole community is like, well, do whatever you want here. And he was like, great. And so he, he really made the place feel special. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we had but that. I, but I do and want Some to, people really have that gift. Man. Yeah. But I do want to emphasize that it really shines in the church. Because you're using it, it for God. Yeah, it won't shine yeah. outside of the church. It just sometimes not existent outside like 
like I was saying with leadership, like, well, maybe that's true inside the church too, but the, you know, just kidding. the, uh, like there was just no, no existence of leadership in my life. I was never called to lead anything or asked to lead anything or thought of as somebody to follow. And then I give my life to Christ and it just, it flipped. It just, mm-hmm. it literally legitimately was like overnight flip. And it's, it's the weirdest thing when I look back through my life and I'm like, I tried to run from leadership and it was being thrown at me. Mm. And I was like, what the heck? Like, that's, that's kind of what I always felt like is like, for me, I've always kind of been in middle management, whether I was, you know, running restaurants, whether I was the GM or the assistant manager or whatever, you know, there's always somebody above you and there's people below you and you're kind of in this middle position of management. And, uh, and I remember, you know, there were times where you just get frustrated and just go, I just want a nine to five job where I punch a clock, I go home, I don't have to worry about it. I can just, you know, just do my job, focus on myself. And, but I, I, I feel like no matter where I ever was, I found myself in middle management because you, you can't mean the center stop. of the Oreo cookie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because you can't <laughs> stop being yourself, you know. And and so in that sense, you know, you're looking at things differently and trying to coordinate things. And and I'm, I always just I just feel like if you're a leader, you're going to always find yourself a leader, even when you don't want to be a leader. And when you know, <laughs> when you're a manager, you're going to find yourself a manager, whether you want to be or not, because that is who you are to a certain degree. So, all right. So, uh, so again, it was serve and God will show up, serve and he will show up. Um, and, uh, and again, um, we were going through first Corinthians chapter 12 and, um, on verse seven, um, you made the statement that to each is given Oh no, that is scripture. Yeah, I didn't make that. Yeah. That's Paul. All right, that's By the way, let me way quote. Better. Really let right. me quote Greg in yeah. Gregorian one seven. Uh, this is not Gregory the Great. Yes. This is not. Yes. So uh, uh, in verse seven, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, and kind of touched on that. Um, but you mentioned that we're gifted at the beginning of our walk, not after we mature. So you know. God gifts us when we when we receive Christ. Um, he may have give, gifted us to a certain degree before that, but He's gifted us for the common good and the kingdom. Right when um, when we give our lives to the Lord. Well, it's just a question of when the Spirit of God shows up in your life. And the Spirit of God is given to you when you receive Jesus. Now, it's symbolized at baptism, but some people don't get baptized at the beginning of their life. And there's this debate out there between, you know, Pentecostalism a second fulfill- and, fulfilling, and infilling. the rest of Protestantism. And they, it started with John Wesley, who believed that he was really reading that there was your original filling of the Spirit. And then there was the baptism of the Spirit that came later as a subsequent event. And most scholars today would argue it's inverted. Like the baptism of the Spirit happens when you receive Jesus. You are baptized in the Spirit. You are fully Im- fully overwhelmed by the Spirit of God in your life. And then there can be a subsequent fillings of the Spirit, which may be powerful and transformative. You can see that laid out in Scripture. And so, but if you're baptized into the Spirit at the beginning, you notice right at the beginning, some people are given the gift of tongues right out the chute in the book of Acts, right? I mean, boom, there's that gift of tongues. In fact, that led to some Pentecostals to claim, well, that's how you know you're saved. The initial sign is you're speaking in tongues. And that's not that's not true either. There's few, that's not few, common now. Either. Yeah, there's few Pentecostal churches that would agree with that at this point. Um, but that is a very common trait to think that those gifts come right at the beginning when you give your life to Christ. And and so, yeah, I guess what's not doesn't come right when you give your life to Christ. Maturity, maturity, right? And so, and so Paul tells them, you got to grow up, guys. You're using these to abuse and break the church up, like. You're telling the one person you can't do this because I've got this gift, and like he's like, guys, that you're being immature. Like, let me show you a greater way. I don't care if you can speak in tongues and to, to declare a billion things to you know prophesy. I mean, right? I don't. I, if I speak in tongues of men and angels, but don't have love, I'm a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. He's like, no, you need love. You need maturity. You need to grow up, or these gifts aren't going to be worth anything. So that's important. And Stephen, you're the one who kind of emphasized this for me when we were prepping the message because you've seen the opposite, right? You've seen I was that, raised in the opposite. Yeah. That somehow maturity and 
spiritual gifts go together? Yeah, no. Um, I think the impression, of, especially after reading First Corinthians a lot, is the idea that somehow if you have a manifest gift, that that makes you mature. Um, and in some backgrounds, w- what is taught as a subsequent fulfilling is that once you receive this, the second indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you're equipped for ministry, and that somehow is com- converted to maturity because now you're ready to minister, right? So there would seem to be some maturity or empowerment by the Spirit. The problem with that is I often find in, Bi- in the Bible people are equipped to do something that they don't have the moral character to do, and it's revealed through the doing. And so in First Corinthians, it's literally them speaking in tongues but not having love. You're mm-hmm. exercising the gift, but you are not actually right there, right in character. The other, what I found also from reading Samuel is Samuel's a guy who's equipped with everything. He has got a good father. He has a good son. He's in a wealthy, pretty wealthy family. He's equipped by uh, Samuel, the prophet, the, the oh, Holy Spirit. you mean Eli? Um, no, I mean, Samuel oh. equips him for Saul. I mean, Saul. Oh, Saul. Saul yeah, okay. sorry. Did I, I think Samuel. But I said uh, Saul, uh, what I'm talking about, King Saul. He's equipped with a good father. He's equipped with a good uh, son, because Jonathan is a good son. Comes from a good family because of the amount of uh, things that he said. There's a few communications there. But then the Holy Spirit comes upon him and then shows him, I'm with you. And yet he doesn't exercise good character. He legitimately does not do what the Lord asks him to do. And that meant that he had every opportunity by the Spirit to do it, but chose not to. So his character doesn't match what he's been equipped to do. So there's a difference to me between your equipping with the gift and the way in which you choose to exercise it. And God cares a lot about how you exercise. In fact, that's how Moses loses his whole job by not doing what the Lord asked him to do for the people. And and so, and I think that's what Corinthians is warning. So I don't see a connection between the ability to use a gift and the maturity of the person. I think you gotta be careful, the more expressive and dynamic the gifts are that are manifested um, with watching the character of the person because it draws attention to the person, not necess- for necessarily their message. Mm-hmm. And sometimes Jesus constantly stopped crowds to say like, you you no longer care about what I'm saying, you care about what I'm giving you. Mm-hmm. I give you bread, I do all these miracles, that's what you want, but you don't hear the words that I'm saying, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> so he would, he would get rid of crowds by them not being able to comprehend what he was saying or go deeper into what his mission was on earth. And I find that to be the case in many settings today where the idea that you're very charismatic and you, you're very dramatic and you can heal people, that somehow that equates to character. And I don't know if that's true. So let me ask you this then. Um, you know, if we are gifted before we're mature, should we wait until we're mature in order to exercise gifts or certain gifts so i actually i've been pondering this especially this week um strangely i was listening to jordan peterson on this uh, on an like an interview with ben shapiro and it was really funny because it's like <laughs> jordan peterson's practically evangelizing ben shapiro this is really funny and you know he's not a christian so i'm not recommending that he has the right perspective right perspectives but one of the insights he brought out was really interesting because he's like throughout all of the bible um, the the only route to maturity is through facing the fears that God puts, be, that, and, but with the Lord stepping out of the boat, right? And or you know, laying your child down as a sacrifice, um, st- walking, to passing Calvary. the test. It's it's this, yeah. But you're doing it with the Lord, not just not against on your him. own. And so Jonah fails, right? Until he has to pass the test with the Lord, and then he still doesn't want to do it. Yeah. And so all again, there's equipped things. ministry, but doesn't have a good character. And so Saul doesn't pass the test. He's equipped for it, but he doesn't. He never faces the Amalekites. He never faces the Philistines. You see him sitting quivering in fear. Yeah. Every time it's a challenge of his maturity, so he never matures. He never becomes the king he could have been. Um, I think if you have a gift and you never engage it out of fear or you never, you're not going to mature. So if you're, if you've got a gift of teaching, the only way you're going to discover you have that gift is by attempting to teach something one day. And you're going to discover, oh my gosh, the word of God comes out. But if you're scared to get in front of people and you never go through that test, you're ne- you may have that gift, but it's never going to mature and it's never going to be rightly used. And you've got to be willing to, yeah, make a mistake. Oh, say something dumb, embarrass yourself. But that doesn't mean you don't have the gift. It just means that you don't have the maturity in that. And I think this is, hone, and you have to hone those skills. Right. Well, you have to allow the gift to be used and mature. Yeah. Skills you think there's can a be big mature. Difference between giftings and skill. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think the gift there's, is the yeah. effect the Spirit of God brings about. The the skill 
you can you can have all the skills you want and it won't have the same effect like like i love giving this illustration years ago and we're talking a lot of years ago i gave over to our worship leader mm-hmm. one time to preach and i was like just you know go ahead preach um I'm be gone for two weeks you do the preaching for the next two weeks and he you know he was gung-ho about it he jumped in and the week before he left i probably preached what i thought was one of the most technically skilled sermons i've ever preached it was so just accurate and like poignant and i can't remember what it is now so it wasn't that poignant but the you know but it was one of those i was really proud of that i got that and i left and I, I gave the altar call and nobody responded nothing happened and so while i'm gone i get back and i listen people are running up to me going oh my gosh like this was amazing and like he did the best job like people were responding like and i listened to it it was the most technically awful message i'd ever heard in my life it was just just a mess and like people are standing up in the middle of it going like yes and like responding to it with this intensity and people gave their life to the lord and other people were like standing and like like agree and it was, it was crazy and i'm like oh that's your god shows and manifests sometimes not because of your technical skill but because he desires to he was teaching me a lesson but i do think that um he could have he had a gift in of of teaching he just never in eventually never even honed it but i, I think that it was evidence that perhaps maybe he had a gift of prophecy it was because he was doing more of a prophetic like uh challenging people but um you know i don't think necessarily i think skill is based on my worship i want to worship god and i want to be I want to do the best job that I can. And so skill to me enhances our worship and God acts through the gifts. And yeah. so those two things, that that's how I would see those going together. I mean, maybe it'd be different. No, I mean, I, I think I, I'm tracking. I, I, I really feel like you have to do an act of obedience to, to even hone your gift, but also to allow God to show you that it's his gift that he wants to use. He's involved mm. in the outcome you're involved in the obedience. So the first time you do it, you might screw it up and God still blesses it. And you see this a lot in scripture where someone kind of does, like Jonah kind of just throws out a message. He's very immature. He doesn't actually say the exact message, but it, it's a terrible message that he gives to the Ninevites, Jonah. And it, God still uses that really awkward phrasing. He even makes it awkward. He tries to make it even harder. He did the bare minimum with a bad attitude and God still used that to save all of Nineveh. And it really ticked him off. Because, uh, but he did obey God, but only, but not in the heart, but in the command. And that again shows me that you know your heart is a big part of the obedience, and God's going to do the outcome whether you're obedient or not. He can use anyone, so He uses Pharaoh to do things. He's used other people to do things. So if you're willing and you step out, then why would God not honor that? But as you keep doing it, you can't just stay like, well, I'm just going to give the bare minimum now. Because I don't care anymore because that's a heart condition of obedience. And so I think that's where skill kicks in and goes, don't I want to serve you better? Can't I do this more? Can I grow closer to you in my service and get better at it and love people more? If at any point your heart sips towards, I like what this does for me, it might not look any different in the way it's exercised, like Jonah, uh, but it, but God sees that. And so oftentimes people think if you work really hard in a message, oh, you're overdoing this or that. It's like, I feel like the Lord wants me to do this because I'm trying to get closer to him. So I'm trying to keep my heart in the right place of obedience. And I think that you'll grow in your skill. So, yeah, I, 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 here's the verse that I think really undergirds everything that we've said. It, it's in the book of Second Timothy, and Paul is writing to his protege, and he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, power love and self-control. And so here's the thing. Self-control is the skill part. The power is what God brings about through the through what he's doing. And the, the love is the compassion that we have for the people and the reason we're doing it. But all of the an- the antithesis to that is what? Fear. You can't fan your gift into flame if you live in fear. Mm-hmm. You can't fan your gift into flame if you feel I'm immature. I can't step out and do this. I believe the maturity comes as you serve the Lord, not just in the, the obedience, not what you know, not what you memorize, but it's in the praying and the messing up in prayer. It's in the reading of scripture and the messing up. And it's in the serving someone and botching up that time you're trying to help your friend because he's hurting and lost somebody. It's Those are the moments of growth and development. And God is honoring our childlike, feeble foilings, but he's gifted. And sometimes you'll mess it up 
and he'll use the mess up for his glory. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of goes back to that old adage that God is more concerned with your availability than your ability. Not yes. that we should go, well, I'll be available then, and I'm, I don't care to grow in my skill or yeah, that's become my, more skillful. Because he like will say said, later. But, I mean, but he a, will you know, use those who make themselves available more than he will. He likes to take people who, who are okay. willing and, and obedient to almost show people who are skilled that they're being lazy. I just see it a lot. Like he'll preach something simple and then all of a sudden that simple person confounds all of the all the rabbis or the Pharisees, you know, and he's like, I don't know, I was blind, now I see, that's or, it, that's all I know. Or just re- just to remind <laughs> us, it's not, it's not by the sweat of your brow, yeah. it's by my grace and... It's by, not by yeah. chariots, but by my spirit, says yeah. the Lord. But also remember that it's the same book that says, fan this into a flame. That he then, only a few verses later, will say, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker, who has no need to be ashamed. So your skill, again, is about presenting yourself before God, rightly handling the word of truth. So this rightly handling the word of truth is based on present yourself to God as one approved. And so, again, your skill is about you presenting yourself to the Lord as like, I'm handling the word right. I want to be right before you. I want to be skilled before you. I'm a skilled worker. I'm building the tabernacle, but my skill is not for everybody to go, ooh, you did such, no, the Spirit of God came upon me, gave me the plans, gave me the gifts to affect this change, but my skill was used to present to the Lord something wonderful and worshipful. So if you're using your gift Hone your skills as if you're a craftsman producing something that you want to give to the Lord and let the effects remain with him because he's gifted you to do the work in the body. Does that, so, that make sense? Yeah. So if, if God has gifted you at the beginning of a walk, um, you know, the Spirit is empowered and gifted you at the beginning of a walk, not as we mature, um, do you believe that he has given us all of our gifts? Um, you know, we already are in possession of all of our gifts. It's just a matter of discovering them. Do you feel as though he gives you new gifts? Do you feel as though he just simply reveals giftings to you as you mature? Um, I don't think, I think that you have a gift given to you or gifts given to you at the beginning, but then he can add gifts as he desires. They're meant to edify the body. I just know that there's been times I've been in different congregations and I felt like... The vocational part of my gifts is always kind of present, but th- different things happen in different for different needs. So you're like, I, if you're in the mission field, you're going to see a lot more miraculous signs. I imagine if you're doing something like you know scholarship, you might not see that as much, right? Um, so I do feel like the spirit is the one who's obligated to give you what he thinks you need to do at the time that you do it. Um, and so the spirit is always with you. So in the sense that the spirit is with you, you are, you're equipped to do anything that, you, you know, he calls you to do. Um, and you grow in that. That's kind of how I look at it. I think we're, what we were kind of skating around that we probably should double back on is just the difference between our view and the traditional view in charismatic circles of the second fulfillment. Because I think that's important for people to know. There are people who feel like salvation is being born again and the spirit comes on you, in you. Um, and then you you go before the altar and have a second prayer calling to get to get the spirit to come upon you and you have a, a complete and utter indwelling of the spirit and this is how people often in many charismatic Pentecostal circles view the spirit what Greg is saying is that here what we believe is you have everything that you're equipped with when you're saved there's not a second need to go to the altar or pray or laying on of hands to receive a, an, an additional dwelling that empowers you the spirit that you didn't have before. Right? Would, would you yeah, say that's correct? I, yeah, yeah, but that doesn't mean he can't add in subsequent, a subsequent fulfilling or where in Ephesians it says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That's an idea of a of subsequent filling, uh, which would garner more self control. It doesn't make you more spiritual. It doesn't make you a like, hey, I'm on level two. What are you doing on Their Mario gifts. Brothers level one? You know, it's like. <laughs> No, there's something about that. You're asking God to re- to use you and reveal through you. I think that there is this sense of like, there is a time where God goes, you're available, I'm using you. And you can see like somebody like Billy Graham or D.L. Moody, these people who have been just empowered and used by God. And they would say, hey, not of their own attempts or their own des- drive. It's It's literally God came into their lives and began to work and move. I do think that, and I'm trying to find that scripture where it says, you know, that 
if you you can ask for um, further ask for the other gifts yeah you can, you can um, earnestly desire spiritual but gifts. I think it's really critical to remember that there are he says there are doubtless many different languages in the world and none is without meaning but if I do not know the meaning of the language I'll be a foreigner in the speaker and I do not know the meaning of the language I will be or sorry uh, I'll be a speaker or foreigner to me so with yourselves since you are eager for manifestations of the spirit of the spirit strive to excel in building up the church which is what what Stephen was getting at this is not about you being powerful and amazing God's not going to grant further gifts one if you're fearful and you're not fanning the gift that you use into flame two I don't think that he'll garner further gifts if what you're doing is to build up yourself I think in the service of the body of Christ to bring people to Jesus, to build them up as disciples so they can be disciples who go out into the world and continue to build more disciples and build up his kingdom in that way, I think he, he'll unload on you. He loves the available and willing person. And I would love to say it's always up and to the right in spiritual growth, but it's not. It's herky-jerky. There are times you're just stuck for years, and even as pastors, we know that that it's not just, hey, I'm constantly growing, and I'm like, ah! And it's like, no, there's sometimes you're, sh- you're, you're sh- falling, struggling, rolling back, and going forward. But then there are those moments he comes, and it just empowers you with something that you never had before. That's why I don't stop asking for... Yeah, ver- it's First Corinthians 14, 1. It says, yeah. pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Yeah, so he's so encouraging people to explore, to want, to, them to want, yeah, ask the Holy Spirit to use gift, use you to, to love people through but gifts. It's, it's love that is predominant, not the gifts. And, and looking at your gifts is a blessing from God. And, and like all blessings we receive from God, we receive them to share them. Yeah. You know, that picture and, of my kids getting their money to use for buying each other gifts. Yeah. 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 And uh, so, so, uh, couple of questions here number one um you know you, I'm, I'm sure when you receive the lord it's not like you know you get this lightning bolt of like now i know exactly what my gifts are you know um you, you might be aware of some but part of it is discovering your gifts as you you know are serving the lord and serving the body um so how do you really understand what your gifts are and this is what i mean by that is number one i always feel like you're kind of going i think this is a one of my gifts, or you're a little more confident, I, you know, this is one of my gifts. And then it's kind of confirmed in you by the people around you, you know? Like if you're like, I, I think my gift is teaching. And, and then you, you start teaching and people are like, wow, you really impacted me. Wow, you were really good and blah, blah, blah. I got a lot out of that. So then you're encouraged more to do it. And then, you know, basically you kind of blessed by leadership and stuff to continue that gifting but would you say that too or you think teaching is your gift and everybody falls asleep every time you talk and, and they fall then, out a window but and you die. are convinced this is your gift you know so being this confirmation by and I don't want to be results driven in that you know but I do feel like if it is your gift and God is using your giftedness there he will produce the results so I think this may your answer may go a little further than I can I really kind of work through because when, when we're talking about this like especially with teaching like I don't think teaching is just effective like in the sense of like oh you know you're you're gifted with teaching yeah you'd be charismatic because and- you can affect people like yeah a charismatic person can teach heresy and affect people and I don't mean the religious charismatic I just mean you're you're a colorful individual who draws a crowd Mm-hmm. However, I do think you're gifted in teaching when you can articulate when, first of all, for some weird reason, the truths of Scripture stick in your head so that you remember them. I, I do think that it's and that too, the actions of your life are living them out like there's a, there's an, there's a kind of a binding between the experience like uh, the best teachers ex- not only know the truth, they experience the truth. And then what happens is they they are able to articulate it in such a way that it's graspable by people. So sometimes you can be overly complicated and not be a good teacher because you're not you're not there's other skill in here too. You can affect people and change, but you may have the gift because you're reading through the scriptures and it just makes sense to you. And you're like, why does this make so much sense to me? That was my experience. Is I would sit around with people and have conversations with them about the Bible, and I'd be like, well, it says this this. They're like. How'd you get that out of that? I've never seen that before. Like, oh, you're right. And you're just like, 
that's weird. I'm, you know, I'm 22 and you're 45. Like, why are you suddenly like thinking that this is, why was this so easy for me? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I I don't think it necessarily has to do with IQ or anything else like that. I really do think, because I've met a lot of highly intelligent people that can't work their, you know, work their way out of a bag when it comes to the Bible. And that that's not an insult. It's just a reality of things. And then they turn around, they do amazing things with, you know, money and numbers. And I'm like, so the, I just want to be able to articulate that what God does in teaching sometimes is both pre and post with the word of God. Um, prophecy, I think, has a tendency to be like something that is that is based on justice and causes a irate passion within you that you must speak out and state truth or attest to the truth of a scripture that is being upheld or not or not upheld. There's there's this sense of like, that's the truth. Why are we not doing this? Like that kind of kind of stuff. And sometimes teaching a prophecy to go hand in hand, especially in the text here. So back to your question, how do you discover it? I think you just go start serving. Be involved in the community of, of the people. You're going to sit in a small group and suddenly you're talking about the word of God and everybody's like, that's so amazing. Like, and you're gonna be like, oh, maybe I have the gift of teaching. Like, Maybe you do. I, I mean, like I know that David, who is great at guitar and great at great at the drums, sometimes he drops pearls like he doesn't even realize. And you're like, dude, you should be teaching. And he's like, no, nah, I shouldn't. I'm like, he will yes, be at some point. You should. <laughs> and so there are people that, and sometimes they don't want to. They don't want to accept. They don't. They don't want to accept that that's their giftedness. And you're just like, dude, you you don't understand. You need to be mm-hmm. teaching. And then there, unfortunately, are people that we are afraid to tell. Because we're not a very honest people. This is where maturity comes in. We have to be able to say. Okay, you looked at me. Was it? Did, no. Is it something you want to get off your chest, Greg? <laughs> Stop, <laughs> Brent. You're not very good at this. I'm just gonna use it as vague as possible. You're not very good at this. Yeah. What, what is this? This you are talking. I, I'm gonna just pray the Lord reveals it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I know because of spiritual yeah. me, but no. I, I, so I think it's important to note that we've got to be honest with each other, because that's where you. That's where somebody's ran after something they hoped they had, and to be honest, nobody. It's like a. It's like American Idol. The poor yeah. person's got to sing in front of everybody, and everybody's like, yeah, that's awesome. But they finally get into a real situation where somebody tells them the truth, and they're just devastated. Well, we can uh. be very delusional about our own abilities. It's usually the reason why I think that if you really want to exercise your spiritual gifts, you have to say to the Lord, uh, the Lord says, hey, I give gifts to those who love my, my bride. They love my family. Do you want to be a part of my family and love my family? That has to be your motivation. And then that means you you have to be able to provide that gift to them. And so I think you need the body of Christ to help you. And you need to be loyal to enough of a group of people that are faithful to the Lord to be known. That's the other thing is... is Yeah, there's no manifestation of the gifts apart from the community. Apart from the church. And so the church authority is important, but also your ability to be loyal to that group. It's hard to be like, yeah, I want to learn about how to how to care for you, but I don't want to be a part of you. Right. That's a that's an odd kind of a way to, I just want what God gives me to do stuff. So I want to be a free agent, you know, like a Ronin. I'm going to rove around and do certain things. And trust me that even people who have to do missionary trips on their own are desperately con- trying to connect back to their home church or to the body of Christ because they see the vitality and the need for prayer and other gifts that they don't have. And so I really do feel like the first thing you've got to do is examine your heart and say, am I willing to be loyal to a group of people that are sinners just like me who may mess things up at, long enough to learn what my gifts are? And no matter where you go, that's going to be the situation. You can be at the best church you think you, you've ever been to in your life, but you're going to have to like serve flawed people and be flawed in front of them. And everyone's got to be honest to the spirit about what is true in order to really find out how to use your gifts. And this is why I want to get back to, and I got to move us to that section. I really said I would talk about, Uh Um, but I think that this is why leadership is so critical and why I said, look, obedience comes before giftedness because there is a sense you got to step out in obedience of Jesus to serve. And then the gifts show up. There's also, I've got to step under mature leaders that Mm. God has put in charge of the church to trust them that they're not out for my ill will. There are ill will teach leaders and stuff because we're not great at discerning all of our maturity and there's no perfectly mature person who's in leadership, but the gifts don't come with an attachment of maturity. 
like a standard of maturity that's written out. It, it comes with, hey, go towards pursue, become pursue love, right? It gives you an aim with your gifts, but unlike leadership designations, it says you must be these things to be this. Now, you want to be an elder, that's an honorable thing. You want to be a leader, that's an honorable thing, but you must be these things. So aim at these things. And if you aren't these things, you can't be a leader. So that means somebody who says, well, I'm gifted with teaching. I should be a pastor or I'm gifted. You can't be gifted with pastorship. I don't, I think you can be called, called, but calling comes after maturity. It comes through a verification process too. Yeah. And that's a whole other situation. So when it comes to these leadership passages though here, and we're talking about, and I said I would talk about this in the sermon, in the podcast, so I want to do that real quick. Are you talking about the leadership gifts? Yeah, yeah and this is 1 Corinthians 12, 28 through 31. Yeah, he says, and, and, his, and God has appointed in the in church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, and on it goes. And what people do is they look at this, he is appointed to the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing. People point out that he, he he changes from first, second, third into another set. He says, then, then, then. And, and so there's a lot of people who will, will argue the first three are ordinational positions, meaning they're, they're not gifts, they're positions given. Um, a gift of apostleship, what is that? Like, how would you discover that? Would that be capital A or lowercase a? Right. So lowercase a is apostles here. This yeah. is not cap. Although and this, the, to me, my, my way of thinking about this is that this is how the gospel breaks into a place. First is an apostle. Because Paul uses this also in Ephesians chapter 4. And he says Jesus gave gifts to his church. And then he delineates these four leadership roles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherd teachers. And so these four or five, depending on how you read it, these these are gifts to the church. In what manner? Well, first, the apostles come and they break ground in new territory. I think um, it's interesting that the Latin term for apostle when translated is missionario. And there is a sense of an emissary, one who breaks ground, who comes and makes the new announcements. Yeah, it's like the pioneer. <laughs> yeah, the pioneer. And then there's the second one that comes in. The prophet rises up amongst and says, that is the word of God. They were confirmers of the word of God. They were the ones who were, like I'm reading Ezekiel right now, and constantly he's saying, this is the word of God, and when it comes true, then you will know that I am the Lord your God, right? You'll know that I am Yahweh. And it's this, like, the prophets come, declare something will happen to confirm the truth. They oftentimes will see miracles, signs, these kinds of things. Apostles will bring these things to bring about a confirmation of the word. Once it's confirmed, evangelists rise up and spread it in their own culture and environment. They run around telling everybody in their own people group, oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? this, is, this is, and then the pastor, teacher is there too. Is all, the elder always shows up in that firming position that they become the established, the, church. The established church. It's not really a church until you have these established elders yeah. that are leading, shepherding, and guiding the church. The pastors, the, the elders, the deacons then show up as, a, to as help the church the elders. necessary. And so there's this very interesting dynamic. So I see these as not first as in first position, as if They're, some guy who shows up says, I have the gift of apostleship. You have to listen to You're talking to about me. rank versus progression. Yeah, it's not rank. I think it, it's progression. First comes this, then second comes this, third comes yeah. this. Then it's these gifts are there. Ordinal. And so these will also organize the gifts differently. Apostles organize the gifts differently than prophets organize the gift. And, but my opinion is that this, this really pushes back on some of these new apostolic groups. Reformation around, groups, yeah. Trying to claim if they show up in your church, well, I am gifted as an apostle. Because they look at these as ranks and the apostle would be the higher than a pastor or a shepherd. But that's not how it works. Not to mention, just because somebody has the gift doesn't mean they have the right, right. over a congregation. Giftedness, obedience comes before giftedness. Yeah. They would fall under submission of the leadership in the area. Notice how many times Paul doesn't even pull his apostolic rank. He won't do it because he, he, he knows that's not how it's done. No, he's not going to be a permanent stay. Like most of the churches are started that exact same. When you start reading Acts, you kind of see the progression. He's looking out, starts the church, looks for the wisest people, teaches them. They become the elders. The elders hold the church together. Out of that comes like a Timothy. 
And then you have the deacons that help because the elders are, are, are trying to ex- instruct people in the word of God and, and, and lead the church with the, with the teacher. And so the deacons come on board to help with, the, with how the church operates. And that's the model of how a missionary does missionary work. Yep. They start out, they may not be the pastor of the church, they may start the church and, and be the first to convert people and to, and to disciple them to maturity, and then they may leave and go to another destination. That's kind of what Paul was doing. One, one further thought is to remind ourselves that um, with this whole ranking problem that people want to say, oh, apostle. Well, why if apostle is so powerful of a rank and it's supposed to be the top dog thing, why is it that in Second John and Third John, when John is writing a letter, he calls himself the elder? He doesn't ever pull call himself the apostle he calls himself the elder and yes he was older but what he was saying is like look i'm a shepherd i'm uh, he's coming to these these are churches that are established established. and so he's not acting in uh, as an apostle he's acting as shepherd Hmm. and so it's it's critical that we don't allow those kinds of things to mess people up and i believe that again giftedness is powerful and you may be establishing your gift, fanned in a flame, but it is only powerful, Jesus is saying, under the leadership and organization of the church. Leadership. And and and, and him as well. That's, Submission and, and, and humility. God willing, the, your, you, your leaders ought to be uh, trying to seek out the will of Jesus for the church at all points. There's, there, I believe there should be that tension of who is holding who accountable and like, at our church, our elders hold me accountable, and I'm here to hold staff accountable, and staff holds the volunteers accountable. And guess what the congregation's allowed to do? Hold the elders accountable. And it wasn't so. like a, even in the early church, people, if, you, if you even look at today in Jewish cultures, they sit around and argue a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, the, and the idea is that we're trying to discover the truth passionately, but you're still like, I'm looking for the truth, you're looking for the truth. We work on the problem. We live in a, in a, in a culture that's so... They don't want any kind of controversy almost it seems within the church culture i don't the outside culture can be pretty you know angry and fighting but it was it wasn't that they were just mean-spirited some of these things are difficult and required wise people to push around the ideas and pray and through that struggle you often get a better result as long as there's a loving response but your truth seekers are going to run into rubbing people the wrong way that's why you give people grace but i just like they're like well i don't know if that's right but what about this verse well then there's that verse are you sure maybe we should do that because you're trying to apply these things from the text to a current situation and that takes a lot of judicious kind of ways of looking at things i know we like even in our you know our government set up this way we have the tendency to believe oh everything's just solved by the position or by the person's authority it's often in the the conflict and the ability to have good fruitful godly discussions that arise from scripture and from the the experiences of others of the spirit moving in people's lives so I, I don't think that we should be devoid of conflict. So that that's my concern. Yeah, I agree. Because when people see in the church, like, oh my gosh, they're having conflict. So you're like, healthy it's if it's, it's done healthy right. if it's done right. Yeah. If it's never done, then I worry because now you're having some kind of group thought process, and that either goes all the way with the Lord or all the way not. Sometimes that that tends to be the results. All right. So we have uh, a few questions. Um, we want to try to get through all of them or not. Eh, let's um, do a couple. We do a couple. Do all of them. Okay, so number do one, Sylvia. Sylvia sent in, and she goes, "Can we go back to the live podcast when you were talking about the differences in Christian beliefs? And for clarity purposes, define what the essentials that unite Christian are. Uh, some of the listeners may not know the essentials of the Christian faith. So part of it is, and I'll let you guys expound, but you know." primary issues or um or uh, essential issues uh are things that to to be call yourself a christian um and uphold the christian faith um these have to be believed and practiced and um and any deviation of them kind of removes you from orthodox christian beliefs and faith and we would kind of call those cultish um and those are any things um, that are uh, that that will break down the gospel um, when when uh, opposite he- uh, views are held, and so it is es- essential that we are unified in those things, and and these are things that we're willing to divide over um, because they would be like heretical or uh, or orthodox, right? 
Yeah. Um, I would say that, so I like to do three levels. Like we've got the salvific level. And so we would call this like spiritual theological triage is one of the terms mm-hmm. that's been used. So you have the salvific level. This would be that which you must believe to be saved. And I would say that it comes down to, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah who is the son of God, meaning God who's come to earth, who is, do you believe that he's died for your sins to bear them on the cross? He rose from the dead to give you life and that he is returning for you. And will you have that allegiance, follow him all the rest of your life? These are the questions we ask when we baptize. I would say that is a salvific set of beliefs and that essentials undergird all of that, like a brick layer. That's the old, that's, what's going to save you. And if any of those bricks underneath that are eroded, then like you said, that salvific belief would fall apart. There are people who can believe the wrong things and essentials and still be saved. So you can you can trust that Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God, who you know all well, that I just said, and you can say like, well, I don't know if the Bible's inerrant. Now, some people freak out that I'm saying that you can still be saved there, but that's not a salvific belief. It yeah. is an essential belief because if you don't believe that, in time you're gonna it's, it leads you to um, how Ero- do I really know erosion? That, yeah, it's, it erodes it. How do I really know that Jesus like told pulling the, truth the thread and, from a sweater? Exactly. Yeah, some yeah. people just never pull on the thread. They have it in their head, and they just kind of go on with something else, and so it might not affect them. But if you actually are working through your logic, your thoughts, and you start, you will start pulling on that thread or acting it out so in some like, way. So, like, I'll give you, I'll give you some examples. I believe that um, while some people may believe that evolution happened without, that you can be a theistic evolutionist or whatever. Um, Theistic Again, creationism. I, I'm a, I don't think you can do that from the scientific side. That's my uh, my opinion. However, I don't think a person who holds to a theistic evolutionary belief is not is a Christian. Not, is not not a Christian. Yeah, they're not not. They're, they're, they're a they're Christian just, if they believe Jesus died, died and rose again, and right. they believe in the Trinity. Now, and, do I think that can eventually erode their viewpoint of the gospel? Yeah, because now you're playing with who is Adam, and once you start playing with who is Adam, how are we all sinful? You have to answer again, certain that thread starts pulling. You start. You have to answer certain essentials with whatever particular belief that you hold. Um, so if you have a, a secondary issue, how you know it's it's going to pull you away with a thread is 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 does it violate all the other essentials and start pulling you away from those essentials? So the same thing is like with beliefs in homosexuality not being sinful. Do you can you be a Christian and believe that? I think that you can be saved and and be misguided and believe that. But if you pull on that thread, the question begins to be, well, then what sins are sins in the Bible anymore? When do when does sin stop being sin? What lo, if the culture suddenly says that this is okay? Does that mean it's okay? And, and so now you're into a whole other problem. The, what did Jesus die for, and why is sin bad? If God's permissive and, and changes well, it, how does that adjust? So it, that's why it actually fits in the category of an essential to believe that sin, as defined in Scripture, is sin and sexuality and marriage are part of these essential core pieces because once you pull that thread, it, some of the very core aspects fall apart. Now, some people will argue that what I call a debate, which would be like Arminianism, the belief that human free will is, is, is able to be absolutely free and yet God will know what's going on. It, yeah. That we would say, free well, that is... Sovereign. What? Some people will claim they believe in sovereignty and yeah. that God's free, that, and we yeah. have free will. And, and then other people who argue, yes, God is sovereign and man is free, they'll, they'll say, but they'll take a Calvinist position, or some will take a Mullinist position. I, I believe the debate in there is over how we agree with what is the essential. Yeah. So once you have the essentials laid out, how they fit together is a matter of debate. God is sovereign, and I'm responsible for the decisions I make. Right. I think that would be all, all positions need to have those two things. And you can argue how that works is different than is that the way it works? Because you can fall um, into dangers on either side. Yeah. Where God doesn't know anything, and therefore now you've no, changed he's not the definition all, of God, and he's yeah. not all powerful and all knowing. So how can he save us? And he's growing in his knowledge, or God is in control of every finite detail, so that he is the God holding the gun at your head, so you sin because he made you. And that would be like no, God can't be the author of evil. And God can't has to know everything, and so there's these tensions, and our and, and the question is debated: How do these fit together? 
that's where systematics and philosophy and speculative theology come together. There we don't divide. We shouldn't divide. The only fourth level I will allow, and I'll say that this runs side in the side. You've got salvific, you've got the essentials, and then you've got this third one on the bottom. I'm holding up my fingers. Top one, salvific, middle one is the essentials, and then you've got these debates on how those essentials fit together. The only one that runs parallel that you can and often do divide over is what I call pragmatic. And this is stuff inside the church. It's, pra- it's praxis. Right? Yeah, whether you're going to baptize a baby or not, whether you're going to, um, you know, you're going to do communion and you how, have to do you, it a certain way. You have to way. do it a certain way. These praxis things that they believe are connected to these essentials or debates become necessarily divisive. They, they divide the church. Because they talk about the practice of a particular local body and how they're going to govern. And you have to make a decision in order to do it. You can't do everything all in the service. It just be chaos. Or you have to do something that has to do with uh, how we govern. These are decisions that are primary for this fellowship that may not be primary for another because you have to make a decision. But on not these. salvifically primary. They're not, salvi- they're not right. often salvific. And if it, somebody baptizes the baby... I don't I say they're, they're not a Christian, yeah. and that doesn't mean they can't fellowship with us, but it, we have to practice something. So we're not going to practice that. We're going to do full submersion baptism. Uh, and so some people debate on how you do that, and we have to decide how we want to do that as a church. Some yeah. do it right away. Others yeah. wait to take a class. And I think what your point is, Brent, is that when you yeah. take those practices and you make them salvific, mm-hmm. like if you're not doing it my way, then, then you're not saved. Wrong. That, yeah. that is... that creates undue disunity so and you would say like um some of these are just convictions about local bodies and their governance i mean i like i said other churches that they do baptism right away after salvation and others wait to do the class i don't think either one of those people are sinning but they have to make choices about what they think was best for their organization and i don't think anything of that if i go there i have to kind of accept that as the practice if i'm going to minister there if the lord calls you there and that's kind of what you decide. Nothing's going to be perfect in these these kind of third, secondary, tertiary issues that become primary to governance, church governance. Um, so, yeah, that's why you can't have openness on certain issues if you're going to get higher involved in certain things. You know, if you're going to be here in the church, you have to be able to, to preach things that we agree with here at the church. <laughs> and we'll get to the second one, and then, uh, and then we'll probably get to um, the third one next week. But... Um, this one is from Sue DeVos, and she says, In the Bible, people have different prayer postures, such as kneeling and standing. When and why did Western Protestant churches adopt the sitting, eyes-closed posture as the accepted way to pray? I believe most Catholic churches have a kneeling, bank, a kneeling bench. Sorry, I'm not Catholic, so I don't know what it's called. A kneeler. Um, <laughs> for praying. Is that more biblical? Uh, this is not meant to be a legalistic discussion. I'm just curious about the ways to pray. Um, I will say uh, I appreciate your question, uh, mm-hmm. and we can discuss this in just a minute. But, but more concerning to me is when did we develop the practice of closing our eyes when we kiss our spouse? That, you know, my wife is beautiful. I want to see her, but it creeps her out when I keep my eyes open. That because they sorry. cross? Yeah. Your eyes cross yeah. this yeah. way. Yeah. When you just, try, you're like, please so, don't do that. Um, <laughs> But I digress. So I think maybe it's women close their eyes and men keep their eyes open because yeah. we're just ugly to look at. We are. And men are beautiful they to are. look at. <laughs> we are. <laughs> and they are. All right. So uh, so again, when did uh, when did these practices start? Why did they start? And which is the most oh. biblical way? Well, we're not talking about, that way. We're we're talking about witches. witches? <laughs> what? No. Nothing to do with witches. It may. Um, so I, I looked into this, and it's a little bit difficult because the, tr- the, rant, the answer is there's no definite time in which the church was like, we declare that you fold your hands and close your eyes. It's a, pro- it's a progressional kind of religious kind of thing that we've uh, adopted if you're talking about when we close our eyes and fold our hands today. There's several moments, I think, in church history that kind of develop, and that becomes the main reason in which we do something. But I just want to go back. Early on, the idea of prayer is petition submission and so the posture of your prayer is important the bible talks about in the ancient world you raise your hands and that's how the ancients pray because it's a posture of surrender and the jews did it this way and many cultures did it this way but the samaritans also would if you're surrendering you're you're also folding your hands and putting together like you're like they're bound almost like and and this is a submission posture as well when you're when you're recognizing and respecting authority so both of them in the ancient world were a position of submission and to 
an authority, whether it be a deity or a king. But just in the practice of the time that was most common was the raising of hands. As we get into the Roman period, we find that um, it only shows up in the Jewish culture in the exile, according to this one rabbi who just who did it because the, you know he was it was a it was a posture of submission because everybody was held in captivity before a king or whatever, and he does this before the Lord. But the Romans would use it more commonly; they would fold their hands as a gesture of submission. Now that doesn't mean it's always a religious practice. It meant like when you want to respect the the general going by or your whatever is going by or you're petitioning someone, you would you have this posture that automatically. You fold your hands, and it's something that's almost they international. Still do that in some Asian cultures too. It's right? the and same posture kinda... because you're like submitting, and so if and think of a baby or a child that wants a cookie. Oh, please, father, you clasp your hands. I really would like a cookie, and Can you're ple- cookie, you're, you're petitioning please. for a cookie, right? And so that posture becomes natural. Um, um, and so the other way you could do it if you really were serious and would embarrass the person is like, oh, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm like Wayne's cookie. World, right? But you could do that to someone if you really like them, right? And it makes them feel awkward because you're submitting to them in that position. So these are both submissions of posture. So, But traditionally through the church, because of the Psalms, it was the raising a hand. Once we uh, converted Christ- more non, you know, more Romans, non-Jewish people into the faith, they just adopted the posture that, of submission, what it looked like in their culture. And then when you get to the middle, medieval ages, this just became the pre- predominant way in which people submitted. We kind of formalize it. We close our eyes quietly. But really, it's just a petition, and it's a posture of petition. And so I would try to do both. And oftentimes in the ancient world, they did do both. You know, if you were brought before a god king, you would, please don't kill me. Or pre, or if you were like, if he was even your father, you would say, oh, dear father, I know you're the king of the nation, but I would like to have, you know, or you, you lay your desires. But there's before. also, yeah, but there's also the Muslim, you know, on your knees, bowing down your head. Which this is, is actually a very ancient. Middle, borrowed from the Jewish culture, yeah, mostly. Middle Eastern way of prayer. And again, what's fascinating is how all of these postures that we have are postures formed in respect of power. It's, so yeah. even like outside of prayer, I think of like the, I'd heard that the end of the background of the salute uh-huh. is actually coming from two knights raising their visors. Raising the visors. And so this was a picture of raising the visor as a way of saying, I'm showing you my face. I'm respecting you. Mm-hmm. Uh, the handshake was the gauntlet of the glove removed as a way of saying, I grant, I'm granting to you respect. I've removed you, the glove. You shake with your, yeah, you shake with your, your non sore hands. He's like, <laughs> yeah, you're a, not, yeah. You, and you use the right hand because that's not the hand you wiped with in, in the, the toilet. It, yeah. If you're didn't have toilet Arabic paper. cultures, but it uh, was your, it was your armament hand. Yeah. It was your dominant hand. You're unarmed. And so you're showing respect. So there's these aspects in the same way. Um, prostrate is a posture of prayer. Where you're face yeah. on the ground and you're submitted. And what you're doing is the reason bowing was considered like submissive is you're showing the neck saying you have right to chop off my head. Um, I am I am in a position of complete submission and I'm in a position in which I am vulnerable to you. And I think the key aspect to the postures of prayer is are those aspects of, of submission, vulnerability and um, recognition so, of authority and recognition of authority. And so when you're shutting your eyes, that is in some cultures a posture of vulnerability. I mean, yeah, you can hit me. You can, you can hit me and do whatever you want. I don't even know what you're doing. Uh, I know in modern times are like, oh, it just, just keeps distractions up. Doesn't just doesn't help me to keep distractions <laughs> out. It does you not. Start. I I pray with my eyes open most of the time because I am less distracted with mm. my eyes open me than too. I am with my eyes closed. <laughs> me too. Must be the ADD. It must be the ADD. I'm so distracted right now. <laughs> so distracted. That's you start it. hearing jingles in your head. Oh gosh! <laughs> but I, I do find that it. But I have a very like it moves me when I get on my knees. Like I like getting on my knees in worship. I like getting on my knees in prayer. It changes my my physical body posture. Just like fasting changes the way that you're engaging with the Lord. So does your posture. And I think biblically speaking, any posture is is fine if we understand what it is. Like, I don't like covering my face. I'll do it sometimes, Mm. but this is a picture of shame. Like, Mm. humanly speaking, they've done, like, you can go look them up. There's- You can, yeah, or or, or fear. Yeah, and and so the the angels covered their faces when they were in the presence of God because they couldn't look upon him. And yet, while I wanna say, yes, there's times I feel like that if I'm like in confession, I'll cover my face. But if I'm in reverence and, and awe of God, I'll lift my hands. 
unveiled face before him because I'm allowed to see him. There's a day I'm coming. I have the promise of his what's called beatific vision. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see, see God. God. Not poor in spirit, sorry. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I'm only pure in heart because Jesus made me pure in heart, right? So I would say whatever posture you adopt, adopt it intentionally. Yeah, and it's not something you can do metaphorically. I actually don't think the Bible is saying, metaphorically do this submission in your heart. I do think that at some point in your life, if you're capable of it, you should be in a submissive posture in a prayer session towards the Lord. It will change your belief. I also think that if you believe in a deity and you believe you serve a real God, then you know it's just like in the ancients, you, you showed respect and you believe that that is a real thing. And I think the tendency to make God metaphoric makes him abstract and too far away. He's a real God that died for my sins. I love him, I care for him. I wanna show that respect at some point in my life with my physical body, not just my thoughts. Um, and I think that posture really has helped me know, okay, you're not just my, my savior, you're my Lord. And I need you both. I need both of those things in my life. So, One of the big things that I wish as Protestants we didn't abandon was, I mean, we have all this like fold your hands and shut your eyes and we kept all that, but we, we lost the cross. The, the crossing of the, the crossing of the, of the self. And yeah. that is so ancient. Like it goes, there is just no evidence Christians didn't do that way 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 back and we protestants were like it's not in the bible we don't use it it's like oh that's something that father son holy spirit what a it's trinitarian yeah it's it's deep now i don't think you have to get into all like what fingers over what you know, it's, <laughs> that, you know that's interesting and but i do think like you're right it's this is like i like to me and me and Jay years ago, he was our worship guy years ago. We would talk about like, what would be a modern posture of prayer? And we were like, oh, you'd have to put your hands behind your back like you're cuffed yeah. and then bend forward like on the, t on the you know, we go out to our cars and we lay on across our cars while we pray to the Lord because that's the best sign of like <laughs> submission. <laughs> wow. Things like that, you know, it's like. I will say a lot of guys that are cuffed and, and bent over the hood of a car are probably praying. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. But I, it, that's not to like mock people who are getting arrested, but it's like that is a very visible image of modern submission to authority. It's like one of our only few ones we have because we wow. don't honor authorities no. in our culture um, people, outside of the military. The military does or, the salute. The military does readiness stances. Yeah. Now, yeah. would you yes, take you do. your hat off <laughs> and there's certain things. Would you want to go back to the sign of the cross? Because that's four points when you're talking about a Trinitarian God. Wouldn't you rather do a triangle? You, <laughs> just oh, knowing you. Spirit. Yeah. I I don't know. Get up and that's for those crazy. that don't know, everything with Greg is a triangle. <laughs> just saying. So. Mm -hmm. you, you go in his office, you ask him a question, he'll draw you a triangle, give you four books and, and send you on your way. So it's, it's a beautiful experience. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we're glad you guys have joined us today, <laughs> and we hope that we were giving you a good answer there. If you feel like we didn't, or maybe you want us to rehash something. Or clarify some things. A lot there. Yeah. And Keith will get to you in a question next week. Yeah, and so if you're interested and curious uh, to ask even any more questions again, um, our email is rabbittrail at obcc.church. That's rabbittrail at obcc.church. We would love to hear from you. We would love to connect with you. We would love to just get to know you. Run us down in the hallways, share the podcast, do all that fun stuff. We're just glad that we got to spend some time with you this week. May God bless you guys and have a great week. And don't forget our new website, pastors at rabbittrail at obcc.church. New name of our podcast? No, no. Oh, sorry. Don't do that one. All right. Okay. You, you Never just mind. Absolutely confused everybody. I Why know. Do you do that. But that's my job. Boom chakalaka. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>